with uh, the Proust questionnaire. Actually, what was interesting in speaking to him when I asked him why he accepted to be interviewed when he said he had never been interviewed, he said, I'm 75 years old, I've never been interviewed, and you're not French. First time a Frenchman <laughs> believes it's an advantage not to be French. But um, <laughs> choose a couple, just some that might, well, get people to get your book, but also uh, get people to know a little bit more about, your st about you that I haven't been able to sess out. You probably all know that my colleagues at Vanity Fair every month subject some well-known person to the... It's not a questionnaire um, designed by Marcel Proust, as some people think. It's, um, it's that twice in his life Proust, who loved these kinds of things, agreed to answer a questionnaire, and we have his answer. And so it's a digest of that. And so in a chapter called Something of Myself, I thought I might risk it. Um, well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll take the page you leave open. Uh, what do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Just to give you an idea, Proust's reply was to be separated from Mama. I think that the lowest <coughs> depth of misery ought to be distinguished from the highest pitch of anguish. In the lower depths come enforced idleness, sexual boredom, and or impotence. At the highest pitch, the death of a friend or even the fear of the death of a child. Where would you like to live? In a state of conflict or a conflicted state? What is your idea of earthly happiness? To be vindicated in my own lifetime. <laughs> I'm now reading this as if it was written by somebody else. Um, <laughs> What, to, what do you think? to what faults do you feel most indulgent? To the ones that arise from urgent material needs. Who are your favorite heroes of fiction? Dennis Barlow, Humbert Humbert, Horatio Hornblower, Jeeves, Nicholas Salmanovich Rubashov, Funesh the Memorious, Lucifer. Who are your favorite characters in history? Socrates, Spinoza, Thomas Paine, Rosa Luxemburg, and Leon Trotsky. Who are your favorite heroines in real life? The women of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran who risked their lives and their beauty to defy the foulness of theocracy. Ayan Hashi Ali and Azhar Nafizi as their ideal feminine model. Is this enough? No, a bit more. Who are your favorite heroines of fiction? Maggie Tulliver, Dorothea, Becky Sharp, Candy, O, B Bertie's Aunt Dahlia. Your favorite painter, Goya, Otto Dix. Your favorite musician, J.S. Bach, Bob Dylan. Um, your favorite virtue, an appreciation for irony. Your least favorite virtue, or nominee for the most overrated one, faith. <laughs> Closely followed in view of the overall shortage of time by patience. <laughs> there. The rest they will read later on tonight. What is your favorite flower? Garlic. <laughs> in, in closing, I'd like us to listen to um, the third clip we have here, which is something that you often do as you travel the country. And since America has mattered to you so much, I'd like for us to listen to a poet who describes what you do fairly well. On the set. Among collated travelers lost on their lewd, conceited way to Massachusetts, Michigan, Miami, or L.A., an airborne instrument I sit, predestined nightly to fulfill Columbia Geeson management's unfathomable will. <laughs> By whose election justified I bring my gospel of the mules to fundamentalists, to nuns, to Gentiles, and to Jews, and daily seven days a week before a local sense is jailed from talking site to talking site and jet or prop propelled. Though warm I welcome everywhere, I shift so frequently, so fast, I cannot now tell where I was the evening before last. Unless some singular event should intervene to save the place, a truly asinine remark, a soul-bewitching face, face, or a blessed encounter full of joy, unscheduled on the decent plan, with here an addict of Tolkien, 
there are Charles Williams fans. Since merit but a dunghill is, I mount the rostrum unafraid. Indeed, for damnable to ask if I am overpaid. Spirit is willing to repeat without a qualm the same old talk, but flesh is homesick for our snug apartments in New York. A sulky 56, he finds a change in mealtimes utter hell, grown far too crotchety to like a luxury hotel. The Bible is a goodly book I always can peruse with zest, but really cannot say the same for Hilton's Be My Guest. <laughs> Nor bear with equanimity the radio in students' cars, Muzak at breakfast, or, dear God, girl organists in bars. <laughs> and worst of all, the anxious thought, each time my plane begins to sink, and a no-smoking sign comes on, what will there be to drink? Is this Amelia where I must? How grey and greenish, how infra dig, snatch from the bottle in my bag an analeptic swig. Another morning comes, and I see, brindling below me on the plain, the roofs of one more audience I shall not see again. God bless the lot of them, although I don't remember which was which. God bless the USA, so large, so friendly, and so rich. Well, I ask my students to consider um, the following. T.S. Eliot, Thomas Stearns Eliot, left St. Louis, Missouri, and tried to make himself into an Englishman and succeeded in becoming an Anglo-Catholic, um, a snob, um, an anti-Semite and a royalist at least and to some extent an Englishman though people used to laugh at the way he wore bowler hats on in the wrong way and on the wrong days and Winston Hugh Auden coming from Yorkshire wanted to transmogrify himself into an American and succeeded at any rate in becoming a gay St. Mark's Place New Yorker which is a start, and I ask my students to answer the question, which, of, which country, which culture got the best of the bargain? And I think there's no question that America got the best of that bargain. And that, in case you didn't know, ladies and gentlemen, is, is Auden reading his poem on the circuit about his travels around the United States, which I was privileged to hear him read for the first time. Actually, I say read. He would always recite his poems, even after a decanter of gin. He would never read from them he needed no prompting. He could, he could simply go to the, usually the um, pulpit. He liked to read it in Anglican churches and um, declaim them, as it were. And I heard it in Great St. Mary's Church in Cambridge in 1966. And it was one of the, one of the many things that contributed to my increasing stirring uh, of desire to, to see um, North America. So you couldn't have ended on a more perfect note and I don't know where you found that but that was brilliant and thank that's you very much you. thank you. Christopher Hitchens <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much